Uh, I was very pleased when Mike asked me uh, to introduce the Attorney General for several reasons, uh, not the least of which is that New Hampshire is a model state for us at BJA. New Hampshire, uh, through their hard work and the work of Commissioner Bill Wren and the folks there were uh, one of the recipients of our first Second Chance grants in 2009, and there were only 15 of those grants awarded, and so that was a, an extreme compliment to New Hampshire. They also exemplified what we at BJA have really tried to, uh, to push, and that is collaboration between the uh, public, private, and philanthropic sectors. I think this meeting is an excellent example of that, as was pointed out this morning, the involvement of Pew and the Public Welfare Foundation. The New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, under the leadership of Katie Merrill, rose to the occasion and provided the uh, match money for the first Second Chance grant. Then along came Justice Reinvestment, and Attorney General Delaney, along with Governor Lynch, led that charge for Justice Reinvestment, and uh, New Hampshire was successful in passing uh, Senate Bill 500, I believe it was about 18 months ago, and one of the last uh, trips that I took until our travel money ran out I had the privilege of going to New Hampshire and being there uh, when Governor Lynch signed Senate Bill 500 in New Hampshire. And uh, Attorney General Delaney was sort of my host there and uh, took me under his wing, got to know him at that particular time. So I just want to say how proud we are at BJA of the work that is continuing uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, they also got another second chance grant. I believe it was for either co-occurring or family-based. I should know that, but I didn't do my homework. So we're really happy to have Attorney General Mike Delaney with us. Uh, General Delaney was appointed to serve as Attorney General of New Hampshire by Governor John Lynch in August of 2009. He joined the Attorney General's office in 1999 as a prosecutor. In 2003, he was appointed Chief of the Homicide Prosecution Unit, responsible for the supervision of all homicide investigations and prosecutions in the state. General Delaney holds many leadership positions to advance New Hampshire's criminal justice and law enforcement priorities, including Chair of the Governor's Commission on Domestic and Sexual Violence, the New Hampshire Interbranch Criminal and Juvenile Justice Council, and the Justice Reinvestment Leadership Group on the Corrections Team. So we're very pleased to have uh, Attorney General Michael Delaney to speak to us now. Gary, thank you for that introduction, uh, and thank you for everything that BJA and, and all of our partners have, have done to advance these initiatives in New Hampshire. It's great to be here uh, with all of you in Washington, D.C. today. Uh, I want to start by talking a little bit about New Hampshire. Some of you may be aware that in New Hampshire we have the largest, the most significant, and one of the oldest re-entry and anti-recidivism programs in the United States, and it's playing out on the national front right now. We call it the first in the nation New Hampshire presidential primary. And it's going to occur in four weeks. And as most of Washington, D.C. migrates up to New Hampshire for the next four weeks, we thought we'd buck the trend with our New Hampshire team and come down here to Washington, D.C. But we do take our job on the reentry and the re recidivism front very seriously. Um, our job is to make sure that these politicians are ready to get back in the game. Uh, and you know, when I listened to Dr. Latessa, uh, talk about the things he's encouraging you not to do on the re-entry front. It occurred to me that's pre precisely what we do in New Hampshire during the presidential primary. Yes, we do shame them. Uh, that's certainly part of the job. We require the male candidates to get in, in touch with their feminine side, and we do require the female candidates to show their masculinity. And we will get most of them to smile as they do their gardening and their quilting in small social clubs across the state. So um, also on the, or the recidivism front, our job is really to remind all of you about all of their past offenses. Uh, and I'm here to report that the candidates continue to re-enter the field at an alarming rate. But unfortunately, uh, in terms of whether they recidivate, that remains something upon which we are deeply divided. But I do want to thank all of you uh, for the very important role that you're playing to reduce recidivism uh, across this nation. Uh, and I extend that thanks not only as the chief law enforcement officer in New Hampshire, um, I also extend that thanks as a proud son of a chief probation officer who is in retirement. This is the most important 
public safety initiative of our day, without a question. This is the issue. And I want you to know that the relationship between our leaders in the correctional field and the, and the leaders in our prosecution and our policing, that has to be one of the most effective and functional relationships in all of state government. And if it is not, we will not succeed in this fight. And we need to be here as law enforcement leaders helping you lead this charge. Thank you for what you're doing. I want to take one brief moment uh, to brag about my state. Uh, that may be uh, in poor taste, but I, I got drowned in the rain for a few hours yesterday, so I think I'm entitled to talk about New Hampshire for a second. Uh, we have received the distinction for three years in a row uh, of being named by Congressional Quarterly as the safest state in the nation. Uh, and that's a wonderful accomplishment that we're very proud of. Kids Count has ranked us as the very best place in the nation to raise our kids. Um, these are wonderful acknowledgments um, for our state. And yet when we looked at what was going on uh, in the field of corrections, we had a recidivism rate that exceeded 40%. Our corrections budget in terms of general, fun, general fund spending in the past decade had nearly doubled. And we were exceeding the capacity of all of our facilities. And I think we began very slowly to realize that if we were going to keep those distinctions that are so proud to us, and all of us um, have those goals in our states that we seek to achieve, if we were going to keep those distinctions in terms of public safety, we were going to need to tackle uh, and overcome the problem with recidivism in New Hampshire. And when we talk about those distinctions uh, in terms of, of being the safest state in the nation, a lot of times we end up talking about changes that have occurred in connection with policing strategies that were in the state. As everyone here knows, crime rates are at historic lows. Why crime has declined so much is, of course, a, a matter of debate among policymakers and criminologists. But no one disagrees that one of the major reasons that crime has plummeted across the nation has been a change in policing strategies. In a recent book, the criminologist Frank Zimmering credited New York City's 80% drop in certain serious crime over the past 30 years principally to policing. You know, it wasn't that long ago that police chiefs considered their primary responsibility to be responding to calls for service, apprehending people who committed crimes. And it wasn't really until relatively recently that police chiefs saw themselves as responsible for preventing crime. Now that brings with it a certain degree of uneasiness that is understandable. Police executives are understandably uneasy about being held accountable for increases and decreases in crime, as these trends are affected by so many factors that are well beyond their control. But at the same time, they recognize that resisting the responsibility for preventing crime is not an option in today's world. Today, for most big cities, one of the most important things that any mayor will do is make that decision about who he is hiring to be his or her police chief. And they see that person as leading the city's fight against crime. The transformation that has occurred in policing where law enforcement executives have used a growing body of research, draw routinely on data, and rely on close working partnerships with the community to prevent crime struck us not so unsimilar to the conversation we're having today about what is occurring in the field of corrections. How this renaissance in policing occurred is a history of which many of us may be unfamiliar. But it began precisely in what seemed to be the field's darkest hour, when cities were flirting with bankruptcy Crime was rampant, and the issue routinely showed up in polls as one of the voters' biggest concerns. 
All of us in this room can take inspiration from the experiences in policing and apply them to the field of corrections. As we talk about accountability for outcomes, once thought outside the scope of and beyond the reach of corrections. It is not. Here to tell us about this transformation in policing and what corrections administrators can learn from is Daryl Stevens. Mr. Stevens is one of the most respected voices in law enforcement. He was at the center of the conversation among police ex executives in the 1980s and the 1990s that ushered in this golden era of policing. Darrell is the executive director of the Major Cities Chief Association. MCC is a professional association of chiefs and sheriffs representing the largest cities in the United States and Canada. MCC membership comprises chiefs and sheriffs of the 63 largest law enforcement agencies in the United States and the seven largest in Canada. Before joining MCC, Mr. Stevens was the chief of police in Charlotte, North Carolina for many years. And prior to that, he was the executive director of Police Executive Research Forum. We are delighted to have him here to share his experiences with us. And I, I ask you to join me in extending him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very, very kind introduction. And thank you for allowing me to have an opportunity to spend some time with you uh, today to talk about what's happened in policing over a number of years. Uh, I've had the pleasure to have started my career in 1968, and a lot of what happened and been good about policing has happened during that time frame, uh, all the way going back to the President's Commission reports that were published in uh, 1967. Mike asked me to share with you the experiences of police executives over the years in dealing with crime and the hope that there be parallels that are of value as you wrestle with this enormous and challenging issues of reentry and recidivism. There was a time when some police executives thought the ability of the police to have an impact on crime was very, very limited given the complex circumstances under which crime occurred. They felt the police shouldn't be held accountable for the crime level. They thought that, that, that what we should be held accountable for was the things that we, we attempted to do, our programs, our initiatives, and, and the work that we put into trying to uh, solve and resolve crime problems, but not, not really held accountable for those numbers. There were many others that believed that our primary strategies of preventive patrol, rapid response to calls for service, and follow-up investigations with a focus on arrest and prosecution were solid and the most effective ways to deal with crime. To effectively deal with crime, we thought all we needed was more cops, more prosecutors, longer sentences, and enough beds to house them. Most were shocked to learn from the research conducted in the 70s that these bedrock strategies did not have the impact that we thought it did. Preventive patrol did not seem to make much of a difference. Rapid response mattered in only a small percentage of the crime calls that were made to the police. The greatest indicator of whether a crime would be solved was not the work of the detectives. It was what patrol officers did when they responded to that initial call. Whether they identified that solvability factor that helped make a difference in whether crimes would be, would be solved. That research shocked us, but it was followed by a series of other studies that had an impact on policing. We looked at career criminals, domestic violence, hotspots, two officer cars, field interviews, repeat calls, and other areas that formed a basis for enormous frustration among police chiefs all across America. It was not clear from this research what should be done we were learning a lot about what didn't work, but not about much about what did work. Except for a brief period in the early 1980s, 81, 82 or so, crime continued its steady march upward. In the mid-1980s, if you all recall, 
the crack cocaine epidemic hit America. Homicides increased to almost 25,000 a year in 1992, compared with just under 15,000 in 2010. During the 1980s and 1990s, there were several things going on. First, it became very clear to many that we were not at all connected with our community in a meaningful way. And this was particularly true with our minority communities. Our high poverty African American neighborhoods were being ravaged by the violence associated with the street drug trade and the property crime committed by those who could not pay for their addiction in any other way. Folks in these neighborhoods did not believe that the police cared much about them. In some communities, the police were making hundreds of arrests, sweeping those drug infested areas, but making little contribution to resolving the problems. And I would argue that probably made things worse. Second, the environment of frustration, rising crime, and limited resources spawned a new group of police executive leaders. Many of those with bachelor's and master's degrees that they earned with the support of the LEAP program that came from those old LEAA days. These folks were dedicated to changing policing. They were influenced by this research that didn't exactly give them clear direction on what to go, but it gave them some clear sense of what wasn't having the impact. People like Herman Goldstein, the father of problem-oriented policing, George Kelling, that examined preventive patrol and its impact, Mark Moore, who led the Harvard executive sessions, Bob Trojanowicz, who was an advocate of, of foot patrol and engaging the communities, John Eck, who worked very hard for a number of years in helping police departments adopt the problem-oriented uh, policing strategy. Steve Mastrowski, Bob Wasserman, Larry Sherman, who did the domestic violence research and was a strong advocate for uh, randomized uh, research in policing. They challenged police executives at the time, but they understood the complexity of what we were wrestling with, and they supported them in trying to help make a difference. Some of these leaders, like David Cooper, some of these folks you may not know, they didn't come from all the big cities in America. They came from cities of all sizes. David Cooper was the longtime police chief in Madison, Wisconsin, but questioned everything. In fact, there, at one point uh, in, in the late 80s, uh, his police officers had all bought these t-shirts, and on the back of them were about 50 ideas that were tried, and, and they, they said, I survived David Cooper, and they listed all these things that, that he had tried to do in, in, in their community. Lee Brown, um, uh, an effective executive in a number of areas. Neil Behan from both New York and then and Baltimore County. Jerry Sanders, uh, San Diego, who later became the mayor. Hubert Williams, Jerry Williams, later Harold Hurt, Betsy Watson, Gil Kurlikowski, who is now our, our uh, head of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, Chuck Ramsey in Philadelphia, and of course Bill Bratton and others were trying to use this research as a basis for implementing new ideas. At any given time, these folks, the num that group has never been terribly large, 25 or 30, and they did change over time. You, uh, they, uh, this morning when you said corrections directors lasted about two and a half years, uh, I was a little bit surprised that I, uh, police chiefs were worn out in about three or four and shifted to the side, so you guys are, are going quicker than we are. But, the, but the, the numbers were not terribly big, but they did have some things in common, and I think those things are important. They had a belief that the police could, in fact, have an impact on crime with the right strategies, the right understanding, and the right partnerships. They had a willingness to be held accountable for their work and the work of the people within their organizations. They were ready to accept the risks, ready to accept the risk, and there are plenty of risks, to move forward, move policing and their organizations forward. They were incredibly passionate about their work. One of the, the strengths of, of the Police Executive Research Forum over the years has been to bring people together and to debate and argue and exchange ideas. And those were, were some of the most uh, stimulating conversations that I had ever had the opportunity to participate in. And it, and, and it, 
it wasn't agreement. The, the, the thing that people agreed on was that we had to find a way to police our communities in America more effectively. Spirited, engaging debate. They were visible leaders in their organizations and their community. They were willing to challenge people. Challenge people in their organization to do better. Challenge people to try new things because the things that we had been doing before weren't having the impact. They were willing to challenge the political leadership, those very people that appointed them to their positions. And they were willing to challenge their communities. Most communities in America then, and, and I dare say as, uh, many of them today, would, would say really the, the, the best solution to the crime is, is what a lot of police executives thought, more cops, more prison beds, putting them away. These leaders understood the importance of balancing the needs of their community, their organizations, and the people that worked in their organizations in whatever decisions that they had to make. And to a person, they embodied that first principle of Tom Peters' widely read book, In Search of Excellence, A Bias for Action. So what did they do? With the bias for action, they did a lot of things. If you remember back in the mid 80s and the early 90s, police in America were just overwhelmed with crime, overwhelmed with 911 calls. In fact, you can, you can rem uh, I remember seeing articles and some papers written about the tyranny of 911. So in order to move the police from a position of reacting to incidents and focusing on prevention and problem solving, they had to manage things better. And managing things better meant effective resource allocation, scheduling of personnel. You could no longer say that you had three shifts that you had to staff and just divide by three and you were done. There was a, it was a lot more complicated than that. Holding commanders and officers responsible for specific geographic areas. Managing workload so officers would have the time to engage in problem-solving partnerships with their community using case management techniques and solvability factors to improve the detective productivity, focusing on the repeat offender, making use of technology to create systems that could improve officer productivity while providing information for solving crime, identifying problems, and improving deployment decisions. Technology had an enormous influence on policing in the, in the 80s. A lot of it we couldn't afford. But, but there were some differences in the way people approached it. Some police leaders used the technology just to do those administrative things that, uh, that could be efficiently done by that. Other police leaders used it to support the work of the people in the field. And their whole focus was, was to try to make people in the field more productive. And the technology was oriented that way. Two different thoughts about how you use it. They created an analysis capacity to support officers in the field as well as management. Everything that they did was, was done with a view towards impacting the work of people that did on the field. And that's not always what policing was about. In fact, one of the things that, that, uh, uh, that Herman Goldstein and his work over the years used to, used to admonish us about was, uh, was, was doing things that had some connection to the work we did in the field. Police departments were famous for focusing inwards. Thousands of policies. But how did those policies affect people in the field? Training, a lot of training. What was the focus of it? How did it relate to making officers more productive and effective in the field? The work on improving the management of police agencies positioned them to move forward with community and problem-oriented policing. Problem-oriented policing and community policing in the 1980s and 90s offered great promise to change the way that we police America. Those were the big ideas. And it was this small group of leaders that were powerful advocates of change that were doing things in their own departments and encouraging others to do that was making a difference. They differed, those ideas differed from our traditional policing in a number of ways. Community engagement was one of them. The police began working with neighborhoods, neighborhood leaders as true partners. Everybody's heard police talk about 
eyes and ears of, of people. Your job was to be the eyes and ears, pay for the, for the operation. But people actually had brains. And they had an ability to influence the environment in which they lived that could make a difference in the safety of their community. And so those partnerships were critical to us moving forward. The police began to focus on problems instead of incidents. Looking at those repeat call locations, looking at the kind of data that uh, Ed Latessa uh, uh, offered this morning, asking those hard questions. Where should we put our emphasis? A lot of choices as to what you can do. You can, hand, you can respond to all these calls and treat them as incidents, or you could look at the commonalities. You could look at the concentrations. And, and the more that we learned about policing, the more that we recognized that if we didn't focus on those problems, the concentrations of, 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 of places where crime occurred, that small number of people that were responsible for an inordinate amount of crime, that our ability to affect crime would never be improved that much. These departments begin to do mission and value statements. Private sector and others have been doing it for quite some time, some for show, some for really meaning something. But police departments didn't start, start talking about mission and values until the middle 80s, a little bit before that. Our mission was spelled out by law. We were law enforcement. In fact, the, 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 the lang, name even began to change. The, the, the words that we use, people started talking about policing more than they talked about, about law enforcement. And these values were designed to help provide guidance in many important ways to officers on the street and to communicate to the folks that we served that these were the important principles under which we wanted to work in a partnership with you to police our community. Like all new ideas. Just a handful of departments in the mid-80s were engaged in it. But their work was energized and acknowledged in several ways. Among them, was the, one, among the most important was the Harvard Executive Sessions on Community Policing that began in 1986 and ran for six years. That session, uh, which I was very privileged to be a part of, actually the Attorney General, Ed Meese, participated in those, was an active participant. About 30, 35 people sat around the table for a couple of days every few months to talk about these tough issues and, and what we should be doing about it. Very engaged member. And he actually, co he actually authored one of the papers that was published of those by, that, by that session, a paper that looked at, at the role of the police officer and used this analogy of a police officer being compared to a fighter pilot. Not, not somebody that was just, just um, a private in a military organization, but somebody that had discretion, responsibility, authority to do things. The executive session members produced 17 papers that were widely disseminated and read throughout America on policing. These papers focus on strategy, accountability, police impact on crime, change, values, implementing community policing, the very, very tough and continue to be challenging issue of race, the role of the police officer, and many, many other areas. These papers and the conversations that took place in that executive session lent considerable legitimacy to the idea that, that we could make our community safer by focusing on problems and a partnership with the people that we served. At the same time, these leaders were engaged in national legislative issues. A steering committee that was formed that included all of the national police executive associations and almost all of the unions. It never happened before, and when it went away, it's never come back since. On, on areas where there's a consensus, there was spoke as one voice, a terribly powerful voice, because there's not many times that all those groups agreed on what we should be doing. National gun policy was an area where this fragile coalition agreed on, on several things. The Brady Bill, getting rid of assault weapons, were two of them. There was considerable visibility, and the voice of police continued to grow and develop in their influence on crime control issues. That voice was critical in the adoption of the massive Crime Control Act of 1994. 
It did many things, including the creation of the Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services with the goal of putting 100,000 police officers on the street. Almost $9 billion was invested in policing between 1995, when the first money became available, and 2000 for community policing. From my perspective, it wasn't that 100,000 police officers that made the most important contribution out of that Crime Control Act. It was the national emphasis on crime and policing over an extended period of time that advocated an approach to policing that was beginning to show promise. A lot of people point to the number of police officers, and it did help some communities. There's no, no question about that. It helped get them beyond the hurdle that we didn't have enough people to do this. But in, in my mind, the important part was this political sense all across the country that this was a good thing. Even if some of our political leaders and, and neighborhood folks and even some of our, our, our police agencies didn't have a clear understanding of what community policing and problem solving was, most people thought that it was a good thing and it was something that was worth trying and people did with that support. In addition, the COPS office provided that much needed boost in technological support to local government. We knew the importance of technology. We knew that it could make a difference if we were able to access it in the way that the private sectors and others were. We just couldn't afford it. We couldn't convince our, our, local, our local funders and local political structure that, that that technology is something that would help move us forward. The national emphasis on crime, policing, community policing, problem solving, was the breeding ground for new ideas, improved accountability, and better results. One of the leaders that I mentioned earlier, Bill Bratton, brought his energy, his ideas, and commitment for policing, for improving policing to the biggest stage in America, the NYPD, in 1994. He brought with him those ideas that had tested in the subway systems of New York City and became known throughout the world as ComStat. ComStat at its base form involved holding commanders accountable for crime in their geographic area of responsibility, supported by real-time data to drive rapid deployment decisions to, uh, to address the problems that they were finding in their communities. He argued that cops mattered, that they can have an impact on crime, and demonstrated that in New York City and later in Los Angeles with a much lower level of resources than he had available to him in, in New York. In Los Angeles, it seemed that those officers on the street were much more engaged with the community and problem solving than they were in that initial implementation in New York City. Police, policing and police leaders have continued to evolve. New strategies, intelligence-led policing, place-based policing, Evidence and predictive policing are all ideas that, that people are, are beginning to test and have tested in the field. Police have taken on new responsibilities of homeland security and are trying to sort out the impacts of the social media, the Occupy groups that cities across America are wrestling with right now, and the growing problems with cybercrime, which we have yet to get a handle on. The most significant challenge today, though, and it's been mentioned here before, I believe, and I believe it's going to be with us for some time in the future, are those shrinking budgets at the state and local level. Most of our large cities in America have experienced flat or reduced budgets for the past four or five years. A survey that I did of major cities on uh, uh, just about six months ago, average over the past four years of uh, of budget reductions of right in the neighborhood of, of 5%. We've seen significant numbers of police officers laid off, 20 to 30% in some communities. Oakland, California went from 800 to 600 police officers, and they're, they're going lower as we look out towards the future. Sacramento, California has gone from uh, 1,200 officers down to 900, and they're looking at, at losing another 100. Tulsa, Oklahoma lost 135 officers. Camden, New Jersey lost half of their officers. So most of our cities have experienced these difficult challenges. The result, retrenching. 
moving back to those core functions, responding to what are thought to be the most important calls for service, and incremental dismantling of the things that have had positive impacts over the years. So what are the big ideas today? What are the ones that's going to help us face the realities of the world? What are the leaders? Where are the leaders that can see that silver lining and the clouds hanging over us and fashion new partnerships and develop new approaches to community safety to help us enhance our effectiveness? I think some of those ideas are being talked about today in this forum, and some of those partnerships will help us deal with those problems moving forward. I believe that those ideas are out there and that there's opportunities in our fiscal environment to make some major changes in the way we do business that will help lay the groundwork for others much in the same way that people did 15, 20, and 30 years ago. Thank you for having the chance to share some time with you. Wow, Chief Stevens, that was perfect. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, for those terrific um, remarks. I think uh, hopefully you all can understand why we thought it would be so uh, relevant and fitting uh, for uh, Daryl Stevens to, uh, to talk to you. The, you can see the parallels um, that what he described happening in policing to the conversation today. The emergence of research that points us in the right directions. Uh, the belief um, <clears throat> that police are responsible for an outcome that they had historically said was beyond their control. A willingness to challenge leadership to shed old ideas and push new values. Federal legislation that came out whose greatest impact was not necessarily the raw dollars, but the uh, creation of, a, of an environment, a bipartisan environment to push these issues. It was nothing less than a complete transformation in policing. And I think thanks to the work that you all are doing in this room, that's precisely what's underway in corrections right now. And we think you all are at the forefront of that movement. And you all are the kinds of people that Chief Stevens mentioned were sort of there, present at the creation, and then shepherded it through. That's who you are uh, today. 